Howdy everybody, Maxwell McGee here, and I've got a special treat for you guys. I've got one of the undisputed kings of Xblig and developer on a scapegoat one and now a scapegoat two, Mr. Ian Stalker. Ian, thank you so much for sitting down with us once again. Hey, my pleasure. So we're checking out a scapegoat two, obviously, and I, I correct me if I have this wrong, sequel to a scapegoat one? It is a straight up sequel. All right. So we're, I'm going to jump into the demo here. I'm playing. Ian's going to be talking. Um, but talk us through some of the changes between one and two. Anyone who's played the first game is going to immediately notice the difference in graphics. So before it ran at a really low resolution, pixelated, could have been maybe a Commodore 64 or a Nintendo game. The new game is running in full HD. Uh, the graphics are just way more detailed, fully illustrated, and for the first time since uh, my career started, I'm collaborating with an artist, with Randy O'Connor who is best known for his work on uh, Waking Mars and other Tiger-style games, plus his own games, uh, such as Dead End. It looks like I'm lighting up these these torches here to uh, to guide my path. But... Yeah, ah. those torches are basically to teach the player how to, how to double jump. And that shows me how to double jump. Oh, that's very clever. So yeah, that was one of the things we were talking about earlier. You, you uh, are working on having a textless tutorial system. In this game, whereas in the first game you had like little messages and prompts and things. Yeah, it's still uh, experimental. I'm still figuring out the best way to do it for some of the more advanced maneuvers the goat can do. But the ideal is just to uh, just to give the button prompts and then have the game kind of demonstrate oh, to no. the player. Oh no! Bad ideas. Speaking of the first game, perhaps for people who have not played or heard of Escape Goat One, um, if you haven't been able to pick it up from just what you're seeing, what sort of game is it? So it's a puzzle platformer, and it's all taking place on single screens, so there's no scrolling in the game. You can always see the whole thing all at once. So that's kind of like the old style of puzzle platformers, uh, maybe like Load Runner or Jetpack. And the gimmick of the game is that there's a lot of hidden machinery, and the environments mutate a lot. There's a lot of destructible, movable things. Uh, hidden gears and contraptions, so some of the levels are kind of uh, like Rube Goldberg machines, where you have to, you know, hit something that rolls across the screen and triggers a button that triggers something else. Perhaps is this, such as this orange barrel. That's my way of subtly giving you a hint. <laughs> Let's see if I oh no, I was totally in there. Alright, we'll do it this way. So Ian, what, uh... What brought you back to work on the Escape Good series? Why not go after something? Because you have also worked on two Soulcaster games as well, which are a very different style of, uh, of game than Escape Good. Right, and there is a Soulcaster 3 coming. It's okay. just been put on hold while I make Escape Good 2. Uh, it was a tough decision to pick which of these series to um, to follow. Like, not a lot of indie developers make sequels. And mm -hmm. You know, I'm not really sure the reason behind that, but I, uh, whenever I make a game, I always have a huge list of stuff I wanted to put in the game, but it put off for the sequel. So it's kind of like I'm, I'm trapping myself into making a sequel over and over. Uh, I'm so sure there's a very good, simple. Let me pause you right there. I'm sure there's a very simple solution that I'm not just not understanding. Oh, uh, I give you a hint. Okay. <laughs> You're gonna want to uh, hit that very top button again. Oh, the, the one up there right. in the corner. Yeah. By hint, I mean I just exactly. By, by what hint, to do. you mean yes. Tell me exactly what I mean. Those are the kinds of hints I need right now. But I'm sorry, as you were saying. So, for a scapegoat, um, there was some pretty good momentum. So the next thing you got to do is get the elevator down so that that barrel can land on that switch when it moves over. <laughs> there was some pretty good. Um, Fan support for a scapegoat, mm -hmm. and the media latched onto it pretty well, maybe a little bit more yeah. than Soulcaster. So I figured I'd take advantage of that and um, just as a, an experiment try making a complete high definition reimagining of the game. But it's all new levels, and there'll be a lot of new gadgets, a lot of new mechanics, and a new way for uh, the player to explore the world where it's no longer a hub and linear stage. Layout, it's a bit more of a 2D map where you're navigating around with default exits uh, that just take you to adjacent rooms. And there are also secret doors, which we'll see coming up pretty soon, that take you to alternate branches in the dungeon or secret rooms. 
And speaking of new mechanics, we also just picked up a little mouse friend mm -hmm. who can crawl around and flip switches and get through narrow, narrow passageways. Please. And you found the one way to break this level. Yeah, because I called yet. him back to her. All right. Well, let's... You mentioned the uh, positive community support that this game had. I know the uh, original scapegoat had a whole bunch of like fan-made community levels. Um, some of them were pretty challenging, if I do say so myself. But oh, yeah. uh, some of them also had a lot of interesting ideas and mechanics. Did you uh, draw inspiration from any of those when designing a scapegoat tool? I haven't actually straight up stolen anyone's well, idea for a level. Uh, people came up with a lot of combinations of gadgets that I never thought of and had some really cool concepts. Uh, a couple a couple worlds were built where there's like a dozen or so levels all based around a really basic uh, contraption that would just kind of like uh, advance the level forward and keep it changing without too many moving parts. Uh, I haven't really you know, taken too much inspiration from those. I've just kind of been making levels that show off the new gadgets and train the player and not push too hard with the puzzles, at least for this demo. But the final game will have a hundred rooms or more and uh, some of those will be brutally difficult. So you've been showing the game off here at GDC 2013. Um, what has sort of the, uh, the reception been like? It's, uh, I've been overwhelmed with how positive it's been. You know, there's a new look for the game, which I totally love. I think Randy's done an amazing job. We've also got a new lighting engine, which is custom built for this by Kevin Gadd. Uh, and it's pretty much just universally people love the new look of it. I was uh, kind of worried that something would be like, oh, where's the pixel art? You're selling out, you're doing the HD <laughs> thing. Uh, but that's totally not been the case, and uh, I'm glad everyone likes it as much as I do. Yeah, so this is a great good. example of a secret door. There's a really easy to get to exit right here, yeah. and then there's a really hard to get to exit at the bottom, just guarded by a bunch of stuff. So this is a situation in the game where you, you know, kind of depending on your personality, you'll either uh, keep things moving forward or torment yourself for a few minutes with uh, <laughs> trying to beat it and find the secret areas. And if you do reach the secret area, you'll be rewarded with some extra hard levels. Oh good. Well, for the sake of for the sake of the demonstration, I'm gonna try to keep it moving. Yeah, working with the uh, local light sources has been so awesome. Uh, just being able to apply lamps and uh, obstacles that cast shadows can draw the player's attention to certain things using. I was gonna say it could be a very good subtle way to sort of draw the eye mm -hmm. towards one place or another to give a, a subtle hint. I've learned from watching those Half-Life developer videos. <laughs> yeah, Valve does a really, really excellent job of that. You want to breeze us through this next room right quick here? Sure. This one looks worse than it is. <laughs> you just have to use the mouse. And again, there's, uh, there's multiple pathways you can take if you find a way to the secret door. So for this game, are you still thinking a uh, Xbox Live indie game release? Or are you going for something larger? Uh, it's going to start with PC, and okay. the Xbox is something that's like a, you know, a maybe. And I know, as we talked about earlier, and you, you may have already touched on this and I just missed it, but uh, level editing was a big part of Scapegoat 1. Mm -hmm. um, is the same sort of tool set going to be featured in Scapegoat 2? Yeah, absolutely. There will be a packed in level editor, and it'll be the same one that I used to make the whole game. And here we are at the final, final room for the GDC. Okay, well, as you wrap it up here, um, do you have any ideas so far about a release window? I would say uh, we're, we're trying to make it spring, and so that's just a couple months left in spring, but uh, we've made really good progress over the last month. Like, it's just really hit a stride, and uh, every week it gets better and better, so I think, I think there's a good chance we can make that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for stopping by, and if you folks haven't checked out the original escape code, you can find it on Xbox Live Indies and also online now as well. Correct. And then, it, was it on Steam? It is not on Steam. Oh, oh. You can vote for it on Greenlight. There you go, so vote inclined. for it on Greenlight. And maybe eventually it'll be on Steam. Yeah. So, uh, and thank you Ian for stopping by. Thank you so um, much, Maxwell. Game looks like a lot of fun. Can't wait to play it. Cool, thank you. All right.